Hello, welcome back to the Celtic Canines presentation at the Dublin Irish Festival. My name again is Jerry Curran, and we know why you came. You came to see this dog right here. This is Pierce, P-E-A-R-S-E, -E. and he is the famous, world famous Irish Wolfhound. Now the Irish Wolfhound uh, is the tallest breed of dog on earth. This dog is about 36 inches at the shoulder. Ne normally these dogs are between um, uh, what, 30 and 36. This is an exceptionally large male. He is an intact male. Um, most Irish wolfhounds come in a variety of colors. This one is typical for most Irish wolfhounds. He's gray. He's actually a, a brindle but he's becoming more gray the older he gets. Now, Pierce here is a year and a half old. He weighs 135 pounds or so, and the range on these dogs can be anywhere from 120 to 175 pounds for a male, 180, sometimes even over that. Uh, what were these dogs used for? Wow. These dogs were used to hunt very large game in ancient Ireland. It's an ancient breed. Um, they were known to hunt wolves. They were known to hunt Irish elk. And when the uh, Ireland was deforested, the environment for those animals was gone. And as a result, these dogs declined very seriously. The ancient Irish wolfhound. So in the middle of the 18th century, followed by the name of Captain Graham, decided to revive the breed, and that was part of, see how he likes to put his foot up on me? He loves to do that, he loves to lick too. Um, it was part of what is known as the Celtic Revival, where Irishmen were looking for independence and for nationalism, and this dog was part of it. And so he became, the Irish Wolfhound, became one of the symbols, four main symbols of Ireland. Now two of them, you know, the shamrock, of course. You know the Irish harp, which is the cachet of the state of the Republic of Ireland. You have the Irish wolfhound and the Irish round tower. You have those last two are not as well known, but this dog is a living, breathing example of the what was known as the Celtic revival, which lasted from the train between about 1830 to 1930. So, questions that you have about the Irish wolfhound. Um, are they good with people? Are they good with kids? We've had many, many examples of kids coming up and pulling on their ears. See, I can pull on his ears. I can put my hands in his mouth. I can even, as I've seen in my own lifetime, little kids stick their fingers right up his nostrils. No problem. This is the loving, loving dog. The size is tremendous size which could be a disadvantage to some people, it's very strong. Um, you'll never have a dog that is more loving or loyal than an Irish Wolfhound. You just won't, it just doesn't exist. These dogs attach usually to one person and the person that this dog is attached to, that is my wife, who is behind the camera, he is very interested in getting back to her right now, okay? If she walked away, he would go nuts trying to find her. When she is away from the house, he pines away for her until she gets back. That's the kind of dog you get when you get one of these. Now, you do have to, uh, uh, you're not gonna go broke feeding one. You're not gonna go broke buying one, although they're easy to find. Don't get one from PetSmart. Um, but you can see that he needs, you say, do they, does this dog need a lot of space? The answer is yes and no. He needs a lot of space to run around and remain healthy. But this dog basically wants to do whatever you want it to do. So if you have a small house and you say, there's your place, boom, there he goes. And that's the way that these dogs work because they love their people with unwavering loyalty and affection. Um, that's it. We're gonna see you. See you soon. Hi, this is Joe Mernan and... Linda Mernan. And we have been going to the Dublin Irish Festival for several years. My parents started going when I was very young, and we continue to go every year and enjoy volunteering. And 
Linda, what's one of your favorite memories? Well, we've got two young kids, and one of my favorites was uh, actually just last year. My older one, who normally does not take naps, um, was beat by the end of the festival, and she fell asleep in my arms at the festival. And it was just so sweet because she had so much fun all day long. How about you? Um, well... I'd probably say that one of my favorite memories was seeing my dad at the festival several years, um, at working as a volunteer and seeing him always driving around in a golf cart. And we wouldn't see him much, but we'd usually see him always on a golf cart, running around, trying to help out where he could. And um, after he passed away, I've enjoyed doing that um, these past few years and trying to take up that mantle and doing the same, helping out where I can, running around in a golf cart and. Uh, flying by the kids and my wife and saying hi when I can. So we really look forward to the festival and can't wait to be back. Hi, thanks for joining in this video. I'm Jeannie Crane. Some of you may remember me from one of the presentations or for your visit to the uh, festival author's tent in Dublin. If not, or whether we've met or not, um, I welcome you and I'm glad that uh, you're joining me. I've entitled this presentation, Being Present. And I did that because I have been really noticing through this time of COVID that the one gift of it that I, I'm experiencing, and I hope maybe you are too, is it's giving me a chance to be so present in my own life. Um, maybe it's a re-gift, a reminder, because it's certainly something I know to do. But to stop the busyness and to stop checking off boxes and to just be be with myself, um, to be very carefully with other people as we social distance, um, and to be in places like this um, where we can really connect with nature, I think have just been really important to me and are things that I want to continue even when we come out of this kind of crisis and chaos that we're in. So basically, there are three points I'd like to make. One is this point of being present that I just spoke about. The second is get yourself to a thin place. As you know, if you have heard any Irish jargon before, thin place means that sense of um, being in a place that has its own mystic, magical, kind of wondrous um, feeling to it. Um, some people would say it's where you can touch the hand of God. Others would say it's where the veil is so thin that the fairies will come to visit. Mm -hmm. In whatever way you experience that some sense of a power beyond yourself, a power that shows that you're part of a larger universe as you also hold on to your own sovereignty is a thin place. So in my work and presentations and in my books, I talk a lot about traveling to Ireland to thin places. You don't have to go any place but your backyard to find a thin place. It's that tree that's gnarled and beautiful. It's that time in the garden. It's uh, that looking and watching birds and listening to bird song. Uh, again, you don't have to go someplace spectacular that's on the you do have to go someplace that's not too rocky and crazy with lots of boats around to stay quiet and centered. But even then, it's beautiful to, to have the nature remind you that it, it's its place, not ours. The third thing I want to talk about briefly, and I can't not do this as an author, is the power of story. And we know that um, the Irish know how to tell a story. The Irish know how to write a story. And having a story past and a story present is important for our tradition. Simultaneously, though, we need to let go of our story. We need to write new narratives. We need to let story transform us. And that's another point that I'd like to make through a, a reading that I will give you uh, a little later in my presentation. Probably no, many Irish events begin with a Celtic blessing. It really is a tradition uh, and one that is kept up in many places throughout Ireland. I wrote us a blessing for today that I would like to share. Um, and as we meet virtually, um, I will begin. May we still feel the sense of community, the joy of Irish spirit, 
and the realization that we, like our ancestors, are hardy, resilient people, people who have faced adversity before and will continue to do so. May we continue to find ways to celebrate the spirit, the stories, the music, and the rituals that are not only with us through a day, that help us through the day, but also help to create a community and enrich our lives. And may we seek out those thin places all around us that can help center us, bring us peace, and connect us to a universal force greater than ourselves alone. So I'm going to um, continue with pictures of Ireland as I speak. So I'm going to continue with pictures of Ireland as I speak. Ironically, I get to show you some pictures I've not had the opportunity to do at the Dublin Festival because there's no technology available. So here, uh, we may not be having a live presentation, but you are getting the benefit of uh, some pictures that I've taken that I think uh, speak, as we all know, um, pictures speak a lot louder than words. The pictures are not labeled, but just email me if you have any questions or comments about anything you see. Um, the first set are going to be of places that I highlight in my first book, Celtic Spirit, A Wee Journey to the Heart of It All. This is a story of a bus full of Americans and their visit to some of Ireland's most treasured sacred sites and the thin places that I referred to earlier. The individual stories within the story tell of how many of the people on the bus were transformed by an experience they had while at a sacred site. Um, the characters, of course, are all fictional, but all of the places are real, and their impressions and experiences are very similar to ones that either I had or friends of mine had or that I have imagined would happen if the characters that I have outlined were visiting. So I'd like to read you a passage from that book that takes place with uh, in Glendalough, which is St. Kevin's uh, Abbey, ruins of the Abbey, um, in, um, that was a, a 5th century um, retreat, one of Ireland's foremost um, and I think one of the most magical places still to visit. Uh, you will be hearing a young man who's on the trip with his dad and his mom has just recently passed. He's a rebellious, angry teenager who's been acting out a little bit and hasn't really wanted to talk. But uh, the back story is that he's been really angry at his father for not being able to stop his mom's death and even secretly angry at his dad that it wasn't him rather than the mother that passed, uh, something that, that, that one might expect from uh, a teenage boy who was very close to his mom. So I'll just read from it as he leaves the group to go up to a place uh, in a remote part of what is already a remote site because uh, St. Kevin used to actually leave the, the, the rest of them and go up to what's called St. Kevin's Bed, which is, um, was his own little rock formation away from everybody. So this is Jackson speaking from Glendalough. I thought I would want to go into the cave and just hibernate, but the sun started to appear between the clouds and it was so warm and the view was amazing. I ended up behind some rocks for privacy, but completely in the sunshine. I spread out there. Mom used to say, let's go lie in the bowl of heaven. That might lie flat on our backs, looking up at both the sun and the moon together. It only happened at certain times on certain days that they were both in the sky together. But she knew when 
and we always tried to find time to do it on those days. She said it was a sign of total surrender. She said one of the great mysteries of life is to learn the joy of surrender. I couldn't see the moon today, but it felt right to lie there. I prefer dark places, but today was different. Megan had told me she was reading this mystic guy that talked about people having a dark night of the soul and about how you had to hit bottom before you came back. And maybe coming back doesn't mean all cheery and light. Maybe it can mean just more real. She said she thought I was going through my dark night of the soul. She had not had hers yet. Most people get it when they're older, when the tragedy strikes. Yet she felt certain that it was a good thing because you went deep into yourself. Why was that so good? She thinks it's because you find yourself and you know you can always trust yourself to make it from there and get out of it. She also said she listened to her inner voice, but she knew she had never really been tested. I mean, I guess that's part of being a teenager. We're still really young and have not always been tested. But sometimes she admitted she was scared. She was scared that she wouldn't pass the test, but she hoped that she could. And then she gave me a soft kind of kiss on the cheek and told me to be brave. I was corny, but it was kind of nice at the same time. Sisterly, I guess, though I never had a sister. So I lay there wondering if I was coming out of a tunnel wondering if my dark night of the soul was ending. I live here in the Finger Lakes of New York. In fact, I'm on Canandaigua Lake today where I spend a lot of time both enjoying myself but also writing and trying to collect, collect my thoughts um, as I finish up this ebook that I'm excited to tell you about. Um, the ebook is going to be based on three passions of mine. My passion for the uh, stone circles, my deep interest and, and really just a, a abiding thirst for more information about the ancient ones and the wisdom that they can provide for us. And then thirdly, Celtic spirituality, um, as it was in the early um, Christian era and also as um, many of us would interpret it today. The three things have taught me a lot opened me to a lot of things and brought an energy to my own life um, that I've tried to capture in my writings, all of my writings, whether it's the novels or the travel books or the presentations I give as well. And the ebook that I'm putting together is looking at the traditions, the rituals, and the wisdom of those times as they might relate to today. And I mean today in terms of everyday, events, special events, and also this time of kind of crazy chaos and change that is more rapid than we've ever seen before. I encourage you to get a copy. They'll be free. They'll be available through my website. And at the end of the video, I will put up my contact information. Um, I'm very much interested in hearing from any of you who have thoughts or ideas about the blog I write and or, or questions about what I've said. Um, thanks for listening and uh, goodbye from the Finger Lakes. This next band coming up, hi, my name's Pat Byrne and I'll be with you the rest of the evening, thank you. This, uh, this next band coming up, one, it's really, I, I'm shocked to know that uh, they've been at this 20 years now and it just makes me feel old, but uh, they've got a new album coming out here in October that they're really excited about and uh, they've got a, uh, another compilation of the, the, the last 20 years. They've got an album out over here in the uh, merchandise section. They're selling it to, what an exciting band. Uh, Toronto-based, critically acclaimed all over, um, and we're really excited to have them back here in the Guinness Celtic Rocks uh, tent. And uh, it's gonna be a great evening. We've got great things coming up here, and we're gonna start off the evening sets with Enter the Haggis. Let's give it up.
you for us. Here's a brand new song. Songs that we are singing will not echo through the ages. 
Cheers. We're going to play you guys a song right now. This is a true story. We write a lot of songs that are based on true stories. And this one is about a fiddle player who got stabbed to death after a show. You're not supposed to cheer when I say that, sir. I'm a fiddle player. True Canadian story. This is called The Death of Johnny Moore. Hey! 
much. It's Brian on the fiddle. Woo. Uh, Around as if I'm fame. I'm proud enough to cast the stone, but not enough to lose her home. And now it's on me, have show the things that were at stake. Should've stopped a thing about a bird, about the mind, and out to with the sound of water shining out us to our face. When we ain't been listening, it could be only see the damage when the sun is settled. Now it's time to live in peace, but no one's here to live with me. I should have learned a harmony before we took a side. Change your way, then turn the holy car and change your wind cool. Do it now, I should have known the air of my ways. All alone, it's in the time of going out to drink the wine as I before you chose you every family. Thank you so much. How about a big hand for Whiskey of the Damned who came off stage just before we came on? 
and the Regan Rankin Hall and Academy of Irish Dance who are doing their amazing twirling and jumping on this stage. Lots more great music to come tonight and for the rest of the weekend. We're gonna play you some fiddle tunes. If you guys feel like dancing, you are allowed, you know. You can stand on those chairs, they'll hold your weight. We can tell, you guys have all lost weight. You look great. Thank you very much. We're going to slow things down with uh, a brand new song. And uh, it, we've, we've had the, the pleasure, the privilege of traveling over to Ireland about eight times in the past. And the last time we went was the first time that we were able to get up to the north of Ireland and, uh, and talk to the local people and hear all their stories and the, the very rich and complicated history up there. And when we got back, we wrote this song. It's called Rose of Tyrone. I'm leaving this country to answer the call To stand up and fight for the nation they have sent for me I'm saddened to leave you in 
and our children too A picture of you I'll be taking in my memory So kiss me once slowly and bid me farewell A butt in my jacket, no trumpets or bells of Tyrone Helping the children get dressed for the day And a handful of corn for the gander Then I'll be on my way And it won't be long till the leaves start to change No Till the snow flies So bitter and pale Kiss me once slowly And bid me farewell A butt in my jacket No trumpets or bells Keep the band warm For when I come home Will you wait for me Rose of Tyrone Thank you very much. Here's another brand new song. A fan of ours wrote us a letter, and it was a true story about a soldier who fought in the First World War and came back overseas to the streets of New York City, suffering from post-traumatic stress, and was eventually discovered by the Salvation Army and taken back to his home and on the east coast of Canada in Nova Scotia. So we wrote this song to remember his story, we call it Salvation.
I'll take a breath and start again. I see salvation in the air. No number on the door It's warmer than a sleeping bag in May Some days it's so hard Just to make it to the corner After all the miles that I gave I wish I had a story I could share But all I want is to be I'll take a breath and start again. I see salvation in the air.
Thank you very much. And a whole lot of the songs you've heard so far tonight are on a brand new 20-year retrospective. We've been a band for that long. Can you believe that?
I can't believe it. We've got a brand new 22 song, two disc retrospective spanning our entire career to this point, the first 20 years. And it is for sale right over here beside the stage. Please do come over and say hi to us. We don't get here often enough. We want to know as many of you guys by name as possible. But come right over there after the set. This next song is a dance tune. We're going to get Craig on his trumpet, because why not, right? This called Let Me Go. Here you go. Let me go, let me go, let me go. And when the ravens surround me like moss on the stove, let me go, let me go, let me go. I will walk down the road with my head held high as my last sweet sunset fades. When the warm wind blows to carry my bones, let me go, let me go, let me go.
Thank you very much. Craig on the trumpet. Woo. You guys having a good time? Man, this has got to be record attendance this year. So nice to be back here. Well, cheers, everyone. Straight vodka in here, I think. really, really. Squeezable bottle. You may have heard this story before, but almost 30 years ago, this festival started on a tennis court, and uh, it's grown significantly since, since then. Somewhat, yeah. Just a little. But uh, yeah, thanks to the support of the community and 1,400 volunteers, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of yeah, hours. Give hand. Come on, guys. This festival is so big that I tried to walk across to the Dublin stage earlier with a couple of friends, and one of them died of dysentery on the way. It's not a laughing matter. Broken axle, it was, it was awful. We're going to get Craig to pull his pipes out and play you some Scottish reels. We're going to get a few friends from the Regan Rankin Hall and Academy of Dance to come up here and join us, too. We just met them today, so this is kind of one of those by the seat of your pants things, but they're, they're really good at that.
hear a song called Mrs. Elliot. Put your hands together. Son, a tiny helpless lad Contracted something hideous They don't know what he had We kept him with tomorrow Never dwelling on the past We can push it to the corner But the pain will always last Never a second was your husband A good man I would say He left you feeling helpless When he took an early grave But you had to raise a family You had to run the inn So keep the door unlocked We need a twin Pretty back to you to soothe your ailing bones. You hung your head and said a prayer when he finally came home. But he caught tuberculosis and you lost a final son. In this twisted game of life, we play your loss. song we'd love to hear your beautiful voices if you've seen us before I'm sure you know the words to this song it's called one last drink here you I've had a life that's full everyone's been good to me so fire up that fiddle boy and give me one last drink when the sun comes up I will leave without a fight the world is mine tonight Yeah. 
I soft in the middle now? Why am I soft in the middle? The rest of my life is so hard. I need a full opportunity. I need a shot at redemption. I don't want to wind up a cartoon in a cartoon grave. I'm singing bone digger, bone digger, dawn to the moonlight. And far away, my well in door. Mr. Pim Belly, Pim Belly, keep these months away from me. Cause I don't find this stuff amusing anymore. Say, if you leave my body gone, I can be alone. They drank to all who lent their hands. Everyone drank to try your turn. Come on. They raised a glass and said,
And we'll sing our career anthem till the day we die. goes on the city fades away and you can't see the fireworks by the light of day we're not on the payroll we just get by but we'll sing our gun around through till we die 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 we'll sing our gun Thanks very much. on the detail. I try to stay inside, eyes and ears and curtains, toes and they die on the sides, casualties and retail. Back then the earth was green, Drew was black and the air was clean. And then I find the scene, cars and trucks and gasoline. Inside I'm petrified, I don't want to hide it anymore. How's it go, top line? One, two, three. Cause I'm never really sure which way I lean Hey mister, what does it mean? He said cars and trucks need gasoline huh?
cars and trucks and gasoline In shell and petrified, I don't want to take it anymore One last time! Well, thanks, guys. We got the Red Hot Chili Pipers setting up over here to the side. You guys ready for a big party tonight? I assume that's who that is. Either, either that or somebody's stealing a lot of gear over on the side of the stage. But they're wearing kilts while they do it, so it's probably OK. It smells like the Red Hot Chili Pipers. Smells like. <laughs> the last few songs we played, and a lot of the songs we're going to play, we only have a few songs left to play, but they're all on that 22 song retrospective I mentioned. We're going to be hanging out right over here where these, these lovely lit tents are, which is that much closer to beer for all of you. So please stop by and at least say hi to us and like rub our head for good luck on your way to the beer, okay? If you rub a Canadian's head for good luck, great things happen for you. Nobody builds walls anywhere, it's amazing. We have Haggis has flags too. This is a brand new song. Fifteen children lived a simple life First I was a teacher, then became a nurse Heard the news of war and signed up for my turn Mother dear, I write you, I am fine and well On the English Channel, under snow white sail Soldiers come before us where I do not know Mother, don't be worried, give my love to all Mother, won't you give my love to all Montreal to London, London and to France Head to toe in white, blood upon our hands We've heard the call, seen the worst of war Salonica, Salonica we go Yeah Though too weak to vote, we serve our country well Push beyond our limits, living close to hell. Bathing kerosene to kill the lice and fleas. Bombs around our heads and rats around our feet. We could hear the sirens in our dreams. Montreal to London, London and to France. Head to toe in white, blood upon our hands. We have heard the call, seen the worst of war.
quiet and serene Wonder if that life was on the movie screen But I got battle scars, cuts upon my skin With no second thought, I'd do it all again I swear that I would do it all again Montreal to London, London and to France Yeah.
couldn't leave you without one Irish song, right? An Irish song about Dublin. How appropriate. We want to send a big thank you to our man, Glenn Forrester, back there on the soundboard, working his ass off, making it sound good for you guys. All the fine people here at the festival, Jamie and our volunteers over here at the merchandise, and all of you guys for making us feel like rock stars right here in Columbus, Ohio. It's pretty awesome. If you would do us one favor, we have one song left. It's an Irish song. We know she's hurt right now because you've been sitting down back there for the last hour and a half. Would you guys stand up for one song? Come on. You guys gonna stand up for one song for us, just one. This is an Irish song called Land Against Ball. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cause the crowd! He's the great body friends and relations who didn't deserve them and come to the wall. And if you listen, I'll make your eyes cause you can spend you a day of land against Paul. Shake so much, I spent in Dublin. Shake so much, doing nothing at all. Shake so much, I spent in Dublin. I'm learning to dance and land against Paul. I step out, he stepped in again. He stepped out and I stepped in again. I stepped out, he stepped in again. Learning to dance and land against Paul.
Thanks, guys. Stick around for Red Hot Chili Pipers. We had a great time with you here tonight. We'll see you again soon. Cheers! I'm J.P. Sexton from County Donegal, the Inishon Peninsula, and I've been at the Ohio Dublin Irish Festival before with my new novel at the time, and my new memoir called The Big Yank, Memoir of Boy Grown Up Irish. Uh, I'm doing a short reading now from the sequel called Drawn to Danger to give you a feel for what it's like. The setting is I'm doing an interview to be a bartender in an upscale restaurant in New York. I spot an ad for bartending school on 8th Avenue. It also promised job placement, which must have meant that they helped students land a job after training. I would need to know how to make American cocktails. It was easier in Ireland where men drank pints of beer or Guinness and women ordinary mixed drinks like vodka and coke or rum and coke. I called the ad about the training. The man on the other end was very helpful and tells me that after one, after I am trained, sorry, by them, I will know every single cocktail in America. They also guarantee to get me an interview at a New York bar hiring new bartenders. It wasn't a guaranteed job, but I liked the odds. My aunt Annie and I talked it over the phone a few times, and I know she changed her mind when mentioning work in a bar because she was against it at the, at the outset, but she said the windows of the World Restaurant at the World Trade Center would be a good place to work. That was all I needed. I enrolled in the training school and two weeks later, I knew all the main cocktails off by heart. I was a little nervous when I landed at the trendy Spanish restaurant in Midtown for my interview, but I was confident I could do the job. I walk in the front door and tell them I have an appointment with a Mr. Barrera. I look around the place as I wait for the owner. It's very elegant with stone walls, which gave it a castle feeling. A tall, elegant man in a suit with a dark beard approaches and introduces himself as Juan Rivera. The bartender school informs me that you are one of their top students, he says with a smile. I am flattered that they would say so, sir. I worked hard at studying American cocktails when I was there. You are European, see? Yes, I come from Ireland. I think half of the bartenders of the city come from Ireland, he joked. He was very had a very strong Spanish accent, but so far I understood most of what he said. I originally come from Madrid myself, but I have this restaurant here for the past 10 years. I have another one in Madrid. So far, everything was appearing to go well. What do you know about Spanish restaurant? Well, Spain is one of my favorite countries and I have visited there several times. I've been in many Spanish restaurants and bars. The truth be told, I stumbled out of many Spanish bars. And you think you could work here in this place, topless? I stare at him. I would have to work topless? Jesus, I never heard of a barman working topless anywhere. I stare over the bar, imagining myself behind it without a shirt. I had gotten a good tan on the construction site and my arms were brown, but the rest of me would be fairly pale. Would I need to be lay on a sunbed? You know answer, you could work at a topless, see? Christ, it was bad enough having to worry about making the right cocktails, but to do it without a shirt? I said to him, it would be a bit strange at the beginning, mind you, but if you need me to work topless, I'd be willing to try it out. Topless? Topless? He screamed the second topless as he rose to his feet. You think you would work topless? Well, that's what you said. I thought it was kind of strange myself. No topless tapas. This is a tapas bar. You serve customers sliced meat and olives at the bar. We no go topless. What kind of place you think I have? I don't exactly remember if Mr. Verrera asked me to leave or ordered me out of his restaurant, but either way, there was no doubt the interview was well and truly over, and I was not getting the job. I'm not sure if he ever allowed any other Irish person to interview for a position at any of his establishments after that. Thank you.